Hey, welcome to another edition of Kyle Meredith with. It's the interview series presented by WFPK at WFPK.org, Consequence, and the Consequence Podcast Network. Thanks as always for making your way here. Check out the series. You know what to do. If you like what you see, what you hear, hit that subscribe button. I do three new interviews every single week, so it's a great way to keep up with your favorite artists. And I am so honored and excited because it's the first time I've ever got to talk to him. Phil Collin of Def Leppard. Hello. Hey there. How you doing? I'm doing well, and let me see how much fun it is. You you all have this. Uh, you had a new record already last year. It, it's not like like you know we were thirsty already. I mean, <laughs> I feel like we're getting spoiled right now because you're already back with a follow up called Drastic Symphonies, which is not a new new album, but it sort of is, and it finds you all teaming up with the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra. It's so interesting to hear how these songs have been redeveloped. I, I'll, I'll just throw it to you. How did this How did this land in your lap and, and what concept did you all want to give it? So um, we were, our last album, as you mentioned, Diamond Star Halos, um, we were in London meeting um, the video directors who would, who would do the videos and also Anton Corbin. And I noticed you got Depeche Mode and David Bowie in the background. <laughs> and, um, you know, we're huge fans of Anton Corbin as we are of, of both those eyes. But uh so we we got to, you know, was meeting Anton and all this stuff. And and someone from the record label said, look, we're doing this series. I don't know that you'd be interested. It's uh, the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra, which is my favorite orchestra in the world. And um, we, we're doing like a Beach Boys one. There's a Queen one. And, you know, we'd wonder if you'd like to do the Def Leppard one. And um, we're like, we're artists and we're really precious with that about our shit. We don't want it just going out. You, anyone kind of messing with it so we said we would love to do that if we could get totally involved and that would mean bringing our own uh string arranger in uh selecting the songs do, doing everything and being part of the whole thing and they said yeah okay then and it it was seamless honestly we we, we got our guy eric gore fan who had worked on diamond star halos and I'd, I'd produced a tesla album a few years ago he'd worked with joe's down and outs uh eric came in and like i said he's part of our team and it was seamless and and the whole thing was so exciting because it was it was reimagining the the songs and and some of the context didn't work like some of the song choices like originally pour some sugar on me was like it sounded comical it was like with, with cellos playing the riff so we said we can't do that one so uh, again we we got around that by doing another version of it but um yeah the whole thing was amazing and and from the get go it really really kind of worked out yeah. Well, and again, I, yeah, I, I've heard other bands doing, you know, working with Philharmonic and, and some of them just say, put the strings on it, you know, and and, yeah. and to get that chance to kind of do something interesting. I mean, that's one of the most exciting things, uh, I think, that uh, about this project. And, and there have been the other ones. I mean, did, did you all, do you, do you look at the other groups that have sort of done stuff like this or or even like, you know, I, when I think of like symphonic, like the who comes to mind, you know, yes. or something like that. I'm like, was that stuff on, on your mind? Yeah, because we we just, me and Joe Elliott actually in November went to see the who at the Hollywood Bowl and they done Quadrophenia live with, with the orchestra. And we just to get an idea if we, how it would work live. But, you know, Pete Townsend is a different thing. He's such a an artist and, and you, you know that he had a lot of involvement in the original recordings, whether it's Tommy or whatever and so that's how we approach this and I, I remember just like even hearing some of the demos on keyboards it's like well that sounds ridiculous staccato make that legato make that and make this breathe you know the lead vocal should should happen here so there, there's a lot more involvement in it as opposed to just uh plonking this great orchestra on, on our stuff you know there was a, a a real involvement and and making it sound make bring tears to your eyes that that kind of thing. that was the, that was the intent anyway yeah and it's not i mean i know it's a different beast altogether but for what how you all layer here your guitars anyway like how far off is it from like in a way in a sort of way and maybe i'm doing a stretch here but you're almost a symphonic band even without the symphony you are 100 percent right and that's what we've always tried to to do is that we don't say it because we don't want to be but absolutely we me and steve clark used to do this uh guitar orchestration that we got the idea of brian may from queen um, we obviously do it with the vocals and Mutt Lang, our, our producer, our former producer, you know, who done, you know, Hysteria, uh, Pyromania and, and High and Dry. And he he would absolutely do this. Let's make it sound Star Wars for the ears. That, that was that was the, the thing. So we we absolutely did. And we tried to do that with the guitar. So not a stretch at all. It was it was absolutely something, you know, multi-tracking, 
making you know where a violin a viola and a cello would play different parts and they'd all kind of combine so actually having having a a chance to do that real thing and actually add that without it sound gratuitous um was amazing and that, and that and it worked it was like whoa this is this is insane yeah so so when you've got sounds already in place like that i mean did i understand like like there's a lot of new material in here you all you know working with the orchestra but but there are moments right when you when you took some of the old stuff and just made it work in like what was that decision making like horses for courses like each song was its own um entity if you like you know um a song like paper sun which was off the euphoria album really lends itself to the epic kind of really over the top your know, pomp and circumstance or actually is it darker than that it was actually real you know real old you know serious beethoven -y stuff you know it kind of got into that thing and then then a song like um pour some sugar on me we, we reimagined it we got uh, our friend m griner because she'd done this beautiful piano version we said well let's do that and and again the strings would work there so every song was its um own project if you like it was it was not kind of one size you know one size fits all it was like a a, a real kind of development on each part and that's what made it exciting it was really fun at the same time we we were getting together promoting getting ready for the diamond star halos tour and everything so it was real it was like a, just a bundle of fun it was like you know inspiration begets inspiration so there's this kind of hive of activity that, that really made it a fun process all of yeah. it and and there's a carryover right there. I mean, you bring a, a um, goodbye for good this time, which is, yes. which is on the new record, and and suddenly it's like, like you really, because it's got its own orchestration to begin with uh, on, right. on the record. So so you know, not having all that much time to sit with that one, like what like what new did you want to offer that? So that one was easy actually. It was like let's get rid of the drums and 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 everything that's like kind of rhythmic to it you know well and once you take that out and eric gorfan actually done the original strings to that and actually played some of them as well so that that was really cool so we, we kind of left that one up to him and, and angels as well they, they're both off the new album so we he, he kind of done that and when you hear you have to keep listening to the to the the, the whole thing and then all of a sudden it it starts making sense when you take the drums away you you need if you haven't got a rhythm you you have to uh create something else I don't want to say fills that gap, but takes the place or, or sometimes not, you know, sometimes the lead vocal, like on Animal, you know, we we actually, the lead vocal was was kind of so great on its own. It was just enhancing that and how, how you made that kind of work. So again, you know, every, every song had its own thing, but the, the, those two, you know, Goodbye for Good This Time and, and Angels were, were, were very, fairly straightforward. Yeah. Yeah. And and that record, by the way, I mean, I take the moment to, to compliment you. It's not going to be surprising because you brought up with the Bowie posters behind me, but but hearing you talking about kind of leaning in to the the, the, the and the Bowie style of guitars, T-Rex and all that stuff. I definitely heard that influence on this one. What brought that out of you this time around? So we didn't realize we was doing an album. You know, we, we was going to go in and record a couple of songs at Joe's house and literally I went to see my daughter, it was her, her 13th, oh, sorry, her 12th birthday. And then the day after they said, okay, everything's grounded. COVID's like, so we're like, oh, okay, no no tour then. And me and Joe just started, literally, I, I said, I've got this idea for a song, sent it to him. We started celebrating our heroes, which was Bowie. It was it was T-Rex, it was Mott the Hooper, it was Queen. It was you know, all of those bands. And, and before we knew it, we had this album that that kind of, it was weird because it, it kind of represented that that thing without actually going out of our way. It just it naturally kind of progressed into this thing. And before we knew it, we had this celebration. I, I remember that even the title, you know, that's from a Mark Boland song, you know, Diamond Star Halos is a, from a Get It On Banger Gong. It's, it's a line from that. So it kind of summed up the thing. Um, me and Joe have always mentioned when we describe that era, we say we go, yeah, it's very Diamond Star Halo, Hubcap Diamond Star Halo, and and we knew what that meant. So the album was very much that. And even though some of the songs sounded like of the era, you know, Pink Floyd, Elton John, it was it was all from that era. And we uh we got really excited about it. And before we knew it, we had like fifteen songs. It was like whoa, mm. uh, and 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 COVID, and it got delayed another year. The tour did. So before we knew it, we we had time to to actually get on and do an album which was rare for us 
Yeah. Have you, um, I, I'm, I'm going to nerd out on this one for a second. Cybernauts. Yes. I mean, because that there was the tribute to, to Bo, to, to the whole scene and everything. Uh, and, and that sort of stayed in the past for a long time. And I know not everyone's around anymore, but have you all ever talked about sort of bringing that back? Yeah. Yeah. We're actually going to be doing a few more tracks actually. Um, John, I'm only dancing is one of them. Queen bitch is another. And I, if I'm not mistaken, we're waiting for Woody Woodmansey and he's going to send some drum tracks and, and me and Joe are going to fill in around it whenever we get a chance. So yes, uh, that, that'll be coming at some point. And um, again, you know, we, we've, um, you know, I've, I've become friends, friend or friendly with Ken Scott, the producer who, who done, you know, Hunky Dory, Ziggy Stardust and, and Aladdin Sane. I, and just on a side, did you get the new, 50th anniversary of Aladdin Sane. Have you heard that on vinyl yet? Um, not that. I've got uh, I've got all the box sets. I mean, because they've been doing the box sets the past few yeah. years. I got that one, and then I just did the uh, I got the box set for Hunky Dory. You know, that's right. got all the demos and everything. But I haven't got the Aladdin 50 that just came out yet. Oh my god, it's like half speed mastering. I I got it. Actually, I was out for my daughter's birthday again. In, she's in Virginia. And we, we went to a Barnes and Noble and got, I, I was like, 50, there it is, half speed margin. Got it home. It blew my mind. I mean, yeah. it just it's so good. So, yeah, we're still very much involved in that. And it, it was still much, very much a, a thing for us. So it was it just really nice to to talk to Ken Scott, who's amazing, who's produced some of the my favorite albums of all time, you know. Yeah. And then, of course, he and Joe on the Ian Hunter album. Uh, like, there's, there's a whole thing just happening right now then. There is. I, I actually played on a track as well. He's doing two two albums. There's there's volume one and two. I think I'm on two. Okay. Which is Beck, Brian May, you know, Slash, and Joe's on there. And it's it, uh, Stone Temple Pilots. It's it's really really super cool and just great, you know, because we're, we're such you know Ian Hunt and Mott the Hoople fans. It's just wonderful that he's going to be 84 his next birthday and he's got this killer album coming out. Jeez, two killer albums apparently. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah, two. Yeah. <laughs> And speaking of extra tracks, I mean, I also heard that that you all like uh, wh wh what's the line? There's another album's worth of material. Somebody said that about this. Well, that may be a little bit adventurous, but there's definitely a few songs that that, that were kind of left over that um, again, which we never had that that were not quite finished. And um, yeah, I can think of about four or five. So you know, uh, from the Diamond Star Halo sessions. Mm -hmm. If you want to call them sessions, I was actually doing them on my on this laptop right now. That's how I recorded the guitar. And um, there's a closet over there. I don't know if you can see it, that's in there. Uh -huh. That's where I do my vocals for that album. It's like, you know, it was, how times have uh, changed. I, absolutely. But it was it's great. I think that you by getting the idea and being inspired and then getting it down is, is so much better than I mean, I love going to the studio. It's great. It's kind of got this romantic thing and you go, oh my god you know abbey road where we, we did the orchestra part was was great but there's something to be said for getting the idea banging it down and going yeah that, that that's great you know that's it well you know talking about you know now that you've worked with the uh the royal philharmonic and, and talking about someone like the who could you all ever see you know you've done the old tracks could you see yourself doing like an album of new songs in this style well we kind of you know we've we've done you know, we, Michael Kamen done string arrangements on Two Steps Behind and Love and Hate Collide. Uh, Craig Pruis, uh, this guy who does all this Bollywood stuff, uh, done the original strings on a, a song called Turn to Dust. Mm -hmm. um, again, which is reimagined on the new album. And um, obviously uh, Beck, you know, Beck, the artist Beck, his dad, David Campbell, actually done a let me be the one and he, he done the string arrangement on that so we, we've kind of done that where, where it kind of warrants it um so i i think if anything uh, uh maybe a, a a drastic two or we, we wouldn't be averse to putting strings in a song like i said there was three songs on the on the last album that had strings on yeah right yeah i mean right they've always been there but you know when i'm thinking about like that quadrophenia style yes. you know they're like yeah. what like I'd be interested to hear that type of album from you guys at some point. A concept album would be good. I mean, you'd have to, that would be interesting. I'd never actually thought about that, a concept album, because it's, a... again, you know, with the industry, the way it is, that that wouldn't be kind of uh, promoted. I think the last one I heard was, wasn't it? Um, oh, who, who was it who'd done a concept album? Uh, Black Parade. What What was? Do you, oh, yeah, you... My Chemical Romance. Yeah. Yes. That, yeah. that was, a, that was a, a kind of a, 
But even that was a few years ago. That's like 20 years ago at this point. So. Is it really? It's amazing, huh? Is that? Oh, my God. <laughs> But yeah, something like that, that kind of seems new still. And um, yeah, that would be really cool. So yeah, perhaps working in the background on a concept, huh? that's a really good idea. So thank you. Yeah, we may run with that. Please, I'm okay. first in line for those tickets when that happens. <laughs> Perfect. Um, I do love hearing all of this. I, you know, I, and I, I was going to ask about Sugar, because did you mention, like, who is duetting on that? That's M. Griner. So she's... um. Actually, she was doing backing vocals for David Bowie. She's this wonderful artist, this beautiful girl. She, uh, she's Canadian and she's, she's a songwriter, a singer-songwriter. And um, we, we saw this video, actually, that was 20 years ago and of her doing Pour Some Sugar on Me. And um, when we kind of dissed our version, it was like, we can't do this symphonic version of that. Rick Savage, our, our bass player, was like, well, what about that version that M, M did? And we're always in contact with her. She's toured with us and, you know, she sends a new album when it comes out and everything. Um, so when he suggested that, I was like, well, yeah, maybe. So she redone it. She she actually done a piano vocal version. Joe done a duet and then Eric scored it out. And before you knew it, the, the symphonic, the Royal Symphonic Orchestra is actually playing on it. So it was like, wow. And it, and it worked great. Yeah. So, yeah, check her out. She's, she's actually awesome. And M. Griner. Yeah, it, it is an interesting version to hear, and it's so pretty. I mean, it's you know, you yes. have a song like that that you wouldn't usually call pretty, and and I'm listening. I was like, wow, this is really beautiful. And then every now and then you have one of those lyrics, you know, hot sticky. It's like, how do they keep a straight face on that? <laughs> well, that was down to her. And actually, when we saw that, when we saw her original thing, we were so mesmerized by how she was doing it that even even the you know innuendo lines, like they they go right past you because she's like doing this beautiful version and everything. So, you know, hopefully that works if we ever get a chance to do it live. Yeah, I'll, I'll hope to see that too. I know you got the tour coming up and I know we're up against the clock, so I'll, I'll kind of close with this one. But uh, um, do you incorporate some of this into the, the upcoming tour? And I know there's maybe special attention to Pyromania on top of that, but uh, it's sort of a lot to kind of take care of for one tour, considering... <laughs> There is. So, so we're still, you know, it's us and Motley. We were bringing rock to the world. So it's it's kind of more that this tour. And it's also, we're still promoting Diamond Star Halos. We, we, we've got three songs from that, which is quite a lot of, from a new album. But um, that's working really great. But what I'm really waiting for is the invite. I mean, if, in, in a perfect world, if we were to do the Royal Albert Hall with the London Symphonic, the Sydney Opera House with the... Sydney Opera, you know, LA Bowl, you know, with you know the Hollywood Bowl with the, with the LA Symphonic and Carnegie Hall. You do a Berlin Symphony Orchestra, that stuff with each orchestra and each each place would be a, a career highlight. That would be really cool. So again, but we got to be invited down for that. You got to get promoters and 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 logistics sorted out and everything. But that that would be really super cool to incorporate that. Yeah, the rest of this year is is taken up with us and Motley. We're just having a blast. And so we're going to continue that, you know, until I think November it, it finishes, we're Japan, Australia. So, uh, yeah, no, absolutely. Out, out in the summer and, and just keeping it outdoors and, and very, very rock and roll. It's, it's very cool. Right on. Sounds like a great way to spend a year. Uh, Phil, thank you so much for taking the time to talk about it. I do love Jurassic Symphonies. I cannot wait for the Cybernauts that you teased here so thank you yes we will keep we'll keep on that we'll call woody up yeah absolutely get on it <laughs> it's been really such a pleasure you. thank you so much me too thank you so much and thanks to my guest also thanks to you for uh, for checking out the episode in the series before you get out of here hit that subscribe button again uh, you get three brand new interviews every single week new and every monday wednesday and friday at uh, right here on YouTube or, of course, anywhere in podcast land, including iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Podchaser, NPR, or WFPK.org as well. A great way to keep up with your favorite artists and discover new ones as well. Then after that, actually head over to WFPK.org. That's where I do a show, Monday through Friday, 6 p.m. Eastern. It's an hour full of song premieres, music news, anniversary spins, bonus interviews, Monday through Friday, 6 p.m. Eastern at WFPK.org. Consequence has your music and film news. You can also find me on the social media spots, uh, Facebook, Instagram, mostly on Twitter. All three of them, the address is at Kyle Meredith. Do hope you like and follow along. That does it for another edition. I'm Kyle Meredith. I'll see you next time.